This is a TRS-80 color computer too, and it's a machine I've never used or even seen before. I'm Matt D'Amico, and welcome to episode 16 of Retro Bits. Happy Septandy, everyone. To celebrate this month of Tandy content, today I'll be taking my first look at the Coco 2. I acquired this machine not that long ago on eBay for a great price that included a disk drive and interface adapter. Back in the day, I did have some experience with the original TRS-80 machines, but the color computers completely flew under my radar. I have never even so much as seen one of these in person before, much less used one, so when a good deal came along, I jumped on it. In today's bit, I'm not going to do a deep dive into the technical specs or history of the color computer because I plan to cover the range of machines in a future episode and do a proper comparison against other home computers of the day. Instead, I'm going to give this machine a good cleaning, attempt to retrobrite the discolored plastic, and see about getting some software to run by building and programming an open source multicart. As always, let's get this thing opened up so I can start cleaning. It appears to be all original as the service tag covering this screw is still intact. There are only six screws holding everything together, and unlike some Coco models, they all appear to be of the same length. The keyboard is connected by this ribbon cable and just rests in place. There are no screws or clips of any kind to remove. The heatsink on this transistor appears to have been bent as delivered from the factory. I'm not going to attempt to straighten it just in case the metal is fatigued and snaps off. The main board is held in by three more screws and the power supply is easily unplugged by way of push connectors. Easy peasy, now it's time for a cleaning montage. You know the drill by now, so let's cue the music. The old adhesive on this badge is super tacky, so I'm going to try and remove it with some isopropyl alcohol. That didn't really work, so I resorted to the big guns. Acetone should make quick work of the adhesive and shouldn't damage the metal, but you've got to be super careful not to get it on the painted surface. This spacebar support is super gunked up. This part must have been greased from the factory to attract all this dust and grime. A little IPA will take care of that now, and I'll use some lithium grease when it goes back in. All 
All right, I finished cleaning both the case and the keycaps. They've had a good rinse in the sink, so it's time to get them into the Retrobrite tub. The keycaps just wanted to float around upside down like a bunch of jerks. Getting them to stay submerged and face the sun proved to be quite the challenge. These keys underestimated the true power of an OCD vintage computer enthusiast. While those cook outside, let's turn our attention to today's other project. I ordered these PCBs from a popular Chinese manufacturer for about a dollar each plus shipping. They were made using the open source Coco EEPROM Pact project created by Mark Blair, which I've put links to in the description below. This board, when assembled, will accept EEPROMs up to 64 kilobytes, allowing you to store up to four 16K cartridge ROMs on it and select between them using jumpers. The design is extremely simple to build. A dip socket, an EEPROM, a small bypass capacitor, and three pin headers for bank selection and auto start. Now I'll need some software. The TRS-80 Color Computer Archive has disc, tape, and cartridge images available for download, so I'll grab a few from here. The images I downloaded are in CCC format, and I need them to be in bin format in order to write them to the EEPROM. Fortunately, there's just such a utility at Joe's Computer Museum. Alright, so on my PC, I've downloaded four cartridge ROMs of 16K or less. The next step is to convert each to bin format with the tool, one at a time. Now that we have our four images, we'll need to figure out how they fit on the 64K EEPROM, and that means getting the start and end addresses right. First, let's divide it into four banks of 16K each. Next, I'll put the start and end bytes so we can divide things up correctly. The first bank will occupy 1024 times 16 bytes minus 1 since addressing starts at 0. We'll perform similar math for banks 2, 3, and 4. All that's left is to convert the addresses to hex, and there we have it. Each image must start at the beginning of its respective bank and not overflow into an adjoining address range. That done, I'll need to assemble all the bin files together into a single 64K block. The converted files are of varying sizes, so they won't cleanly concatenate with a simple copy command. There are several options here, including using a hex editor or the Linux DD command to pad out the individual files, but the easiest method I found is just to load each image into the EEPROM burner software's buffer in their correct address space. 
The operation is straightforward enough. Starting with an empty buffer, load the first image in at address 0. Repeat the process for the next three images, loading them into the correct starting addresses that we previously calculated, while being sure not to erase what's already in the buffer. Now that I've assembled a bin file that contains all four cartridges in the correct address space, it's time to write it to the EEPROM. I'll be using the popular TL8662+, which I picked up on AliExpress for around 43 US dollars. By default, the software will first erase the chip before writing, then run a verification pass after the programming is complete. The program chip goes into the socket and jumpers are installed to select one of the four banks and enable auto start. And that's one completed Coco EEPROM pack ready to test out. Meanwhile, the Retrobrite is finishing up. With some fresh peroxide, the reaction is apparent by the appearance of bubbles all over the workpieces. I didn't get these when I tested reusing old solution back in episode 9, so I'm hoping for a better result this time around. Despite my best efforts, these guys were determined to do their own thing. I stirred them around every 30 minutes or so to even out their exposure to the sun. They're looking good after their spa day, so I better get them out of the pool before they start to prune up. All the parts get a rinse in the sink to remove any residual peroxide, and then they're set out to dry. With all the parts dry, it's time for another montage. I've not used this product before, but I've seen it appear multiple times on Adrian's digital basement, so I thought I'd give it a shot. It's supposed to protect from UV, so hopefully it'll slow down future yellowing. Okay, time to see how we did. This is how the machine looked when I first unboxed it. After a thorough cleaning, it's already better. With Retrobrite, the worst of the splotchy uneven yellowing is gone, but it's not perfect. I don't want to go any further because I'm afraid of overwhitening the areas that are already fine, so I'm going to leave it as is for now. It's finally time to connect things up. The Coco 2 only has RF output, not even composite, so I'm going to use an old VCR in order to connect it to a monitor, as I don't have a suitable analog television anymore. All right, moment of truth. This is the first time I've powered it up since I bought this machine. Let's see what happens. Fingers crossed. Hey. Sweet, so that's promising. The machine was listed on eBay as untested, but it looks like the gamble paid off. So that's one less thing to fix. 
One thing I noticed immediately is that the clear key is positioned where enter should be, and I kept accidentally erasing every line I typed at first. Now that we know the system works, it's time to test out the cartridge. Let's plug it in and see what happens. Uh-oh, that's not looking too good. Better test out one of the other banks. So just about every image I tried from three different websites failed to work. I spent about four hours checking all my solder joints and continuity, swapping EEPROMs, comparing hex dumps, and converting and burning something like 40 different bin files. Out of all of them, I only got two games to work. At least the machine and cartridge seemed to be okay, so it looks like a software problem. I scoured the internet looking for answers, and eventually found a post on the Vintage Computer Federation that led to the answer. The CCC to bin software that I had been using appends a header and footer to the output file for emulation, but this breaks the image on real hardware. A quick one-line change to the script and everything started working perfectly. So. First impressions? Well, the Coco 2 hit the market in 1983 and was basically a refreshed Coco 1 with a redesigned look, improved keyboard, cost reduced chipset, and up to 64K of RAM. For 1983, that was a good amount of memory and it was well positioned amongst its peers. The Motorola 6809 processor had some interesting tricks up its sleeve compared to the MOS 6502, which we'll look at more in depth in future bits. The redesigned case is a nice improvement, and it looks right at home amongst other machines of the period. It's also quite compact given that it has an internal power supply. The keyboard layout is standard with full-sized keys, but the clear key is poorly positioned, and there's a lack of any kind of function keys or modifiers like Ctrl or Alt. There's a good weight behind each key press, and the travel is nice, but it does make a bit of a plasticky sound when you type. I like the red brake button, it really stands out in the sea of beige. To me, the default green color scheme is a bit jarring, and the Motorola 6847 video chip offers average resolution for the day and a limited color palette. It can display bitmap graphics modes with up to four simultaneous colors, but lacks hardware sprites. The emission of composite or lumachroma output means the video quality isn't great on a high-end monitor, but it was designed to be connected to the living room TV of the era and probably was fine for that. The 6-bit digital-to-analog converter yields decent single-voice sound, and it's better than some systems that only featured a beeper-type speaker, but it doesn't stand on equal footing with the likes of the TI-99, VIC-20, or Atari 800 that all have dedicated polyphonic sound chips. So there we have it, the TRS-80 Color Computer 2 and Coco EEPROM Pack. In future bits, I'll try and figure out how to get some software on a floppy so I can test out the disk drive it came with. I also plan to do a proper review of the system's capabilities and compare it against its contemporaries, so look forward to that if that's the sort of thing you look forward to. Oh, and RetroBits is now on Twitter, so please follow along if you'd like to stay up to date and join in on the conversation. I hope you enjoyed this bit, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on RetroBits. <laughs>